Hi guys, I'm George Dahl and welcome back to my film journal on this very special retrospective episode. I'm speaking with Granite, the host of the Granite Mountain Movie Club podcast. Granite and his compatriots have a wonderful camaraderie. I've been a big fan of their show and I knew I really wanted to have him on. So today we spoke about Peter Weir's 1985 thriller film Witness starring Harrison Ford and Kelly McGillis in which Harrison Ford plays a streetwise Philadelphia police officer who becomes embroiled in a homicide case involving the sole witness to a murder, a young Amish boy visiting the big city. Matters become more complicated when it becomes revealed to Ford that the murder might in fact have its nexus at the very heart of the police department. Therefore, he needs to go into hiding in the Amish community and drama and intrigue ensues. It's a really spectacular film from one of my favorite filmmakers, Peter Weir, and I think we had a really great conversation. I'm excited for you guys to hear it. So without further ado, let's get started. Harrison Ford and Kelly McGillis. Witness. We're talking today about Peter Weir's Witness, and that was a movie that you had brought up that you wanted to talk about. And I assume it's because you were doing a little research for The Truman Show. Yeah, I think that's how I found it. I, um, so I'd been wa I recently watched all the Michael Mann films, mm. and I think I remember Witness being on some list of like good eighties. They might have called it a thriller or something. And I think I saw it there. But then when I was doing the Truman Show stuff, I noticed it was Peter Weir, and I was like, "Oh, that's interesting." Like, what did his movies look like before Truman Show? Because I, did, you know, and of course everyone knows Master and Commander, but I didn't know. Uh, I hadn't seen Mosquito Coast, and I've now seen about half of that one. I oh, got interrupted when I, I was watching it. I love Mosquito Coast. Yeah, I like the first half so far. I, I'm looking forward to finishing it. But yeah, I hadn't seen a lot of his stuff, so I so I was like, yeah, this one. I'm excited to see this one. And what'd you think of it? My takeaway, and there's like this like a recurring theme for my for the movie. It's just like pleasant surprise. There's quite a few. I liked it more than I thought I would. And then also there's there's lots of story aspects that I was surprised how they handled them pleasantly i was like wow they you know they avoided what i felt like was kind of going to be a trap and they and they took a different path and so i was i was really happy with it i i um i i liked it a lot you know it's a very very good movie i think i think if you if i was an 80s hollywood producer and you brought me that script a cop has to go into hiding in an amish community big city cop you'd be like brilliant get me eddie murphy <laughs> You know, or what are you, right? Or, uh, oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> awesome. But uh, the movie, it, it's a high concept, but it doesn't, it doesn't play like it's a high concept movie, right? It doesn't, it doesn't, yeah. uh, it's, it's a relaxed, you know, uh, movie that is just sort of like a tone poem of, of, of this sort of lifestyle. There's a, there's a real tonal shift that I detected from the beginning of the film when we have Rachel and her son in the city to when we go to the Amish village. And the movie kind of withholds Harrison Ford from you for a long time. It's probably about 20 minutes before he actually shows up. Yeah. Um, then when the way he arrives is they don't have a big Harrison Ford movie star entrance. It's sort of he he comes into this, the scene as the, he would be experienced by the child. Right. Just sort of appearing. And it's interesting, too, I think, how he plays that. He's almost he's not distressed by the murder scene. It's a perfunctory routine thing. He's going through the murder. He's talking to people when the kid you know, throws a sly joke at his, or, you know, calls his partner a runt. He laughs compared to like the two of them who are totally like, they're, they're totally out of their depth. They're frightened. They're in a place they don't know. They can't get a hold of their family. Right. Mm -hmm. And then he takes them on a little ride. And I love the funniest line in the movie, I think is that um, when uh, Kelly McGill says something of like, uh, we don't abide by your laws. You don't understand. We want nothing to do with your laws. <laughs> doesn't surprise me. <laughs> a lot of people I meet are like that. But, uh, yeah. yeah, when he goes to that bar, he grabs that guy and like, uh, well, th this isn't the roundup scene, but it's kind of the first person he he suspects. He yeah. goes to that bar and grabs him and roughs him up on the street, and and he's like, oh, it's not that guy. Okay, never mind. And then that guy, <laughs> yeah, that guy is like, he just laughs it off because he's like, and I I, I like that part because he's like, he's in the game, right? He's probably a criminal of some sort, and like. And, and like both parties kind of know their role in the game and yeah we wouldn't that 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 guy that he roughs up would not probably look the same if they made that mo in the movie today no way the thing i was pleasantly surprised in rewatching it is that unlike a movie today they don't mine the amish scenes for comic relief and fish out of water humor with harrison ford i, I was thinking oh he's gonna get there and he's gonna struggle but 
he i mean he, there's like some there are some instances where you know he doesn't know how to act or something honey that's great coffee it's a it's a joke it's a commercial but they're not they're not overdone and it's like it's like well he actually he's a carpenter so so he actually kind of fits in that way and he's um you know he's just like a practical masculine competent guy so um so he fits in to the community like kind of you know he has some different uh he's different in in some ways and there's like some some minor tension around that but but yeah i totally thought they were going to do quite a bit more oh you can't say that here you can't do that here you can't act like that here but but that was that was one of the things i was pleasantly surprised about is they they showed him uh, actually kind of succeeding in that community and the movie's sort of structured in a way, almost like Master and Commander, to where it's kind of episodic. Um, it's really not in a hurry to get anywhere. You know, like when, once they're there, it's sort of a, a series of, you know, building the house, um, working in the barn, you know, experiencing Amish life. It's not very plot driven. Eventually, we cut back to the idea of the plot, kind of like with Master and Commander, where the mo- motivating thrust of the movie is we're trying to get this French ship. But in the meantime, we're going to show you all the ways of how these people lived on these ships back in the day on the sort of tone poem thing that the part where they're it's a really beautiful segment where they're uh building that barn and yeah, they is. got like that they got the music going um which is you know i think it was kind of like a synth but inspired by like american american folk uh, classical music and then um you know they're actually building the barn which visually looks really cool and then they do um it, it almost reminded me it was kind of like a Barry Lyndon type outdoor photography. Oh yeah, uh, wide wide angle. Uh, it looked awesome, and you, and you have all the the little kids doing their little thing, and the, that was a really beautiful, like three minutes or something. Yeah, just sort of. Hey, we're gonna stop now, and uh, this is not really moving the plot forward. Really, it's just. Uh, you yeah, know. you're just watching a barn be built. I mean, there's a little bit of story in that you see. Mm-hmm. I think like Rachel serves him first. Like when and like and a couple of people notice, they're like, uh, right, know, she's right, playing, right. She, she's playing favorites, and then you also see that the uh, that um, the romantic rival guy, you know, that you see him, you see the two of them like working together. So that's kind of like a there's some story in those moments, but otherwise, it's yeah, it's just it's kind of like, just like a music video. Good kid, by the way. Yeah, w- Lucas. What's his name? Lucas, Lucas Haas, uh, right? Who, 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 yeah, he, he went, went on, on to do, do others. Yeah, other stuff. They handle the child actor thing really well because he doesn't they don't they don't make him do too much but, you know they no they, they just have him he's mostly quietly observing as, as a lot of kids do around adults uh, that's a great point and he didn't have to be like a funny goofball that you know stole America's heart you know what I'm saying he he just got to be like a cute little kid and I love those moments too in the train station where he the whole train thing at the beginning, the train it's station great. is, is great. It's, like yeah. the inner city train station looks beautiful, but you know, the overwhelmed Amish kid, mm-hmm. it's, it's good. Uh, there was that shot too with that. There's a, I think it's a statue of an angel and mm-hmm. it looks so impossibly high. I felt like they almost like had to build another one. Or I don't know how they got up there to shoot over the shoulder of that statue down to the kid, but it's a beautiful shot. You know, he's just yeah. overwhelmed by the big world. A lot of, you yeah. know, we talked about the lack of, of action, but I mean, there is a lot of great little suspenseful scenes, especially when the when Danny Glover is kicking open the the stalls in the restroom. Yeah, and then and the maneuver, yeah, to, to switch stalls and stuff. I thought that was cool. Yeah, it was cool. It's a little unrealistic. You'd you'd probably notice, but but still, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice, nicely done. I thought. Oh, you know, I was also actually quite surprised. You know, they introduced that gun in the mm-hmm. bedroom when when the boy finds the gun. And I'm thinking, oh, okay. So you know, the the Amish have this. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't exactly know their rules, but uh, I guess a doctrine or something of passivity, or pacifism. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, but now, but now the kid has found the gun, and so is there? Is he gonna have to use it? Is the kid gonna have to use it? And they they set it up. It feels like the kid might ha- might get an opportunity to use the gun. Never, ever touch a loaded gun. I'm taking the bullets out. Now it's safe. Okay. Okay, Mister Bull. Um, but he doesn't. That's you know I don't if the part I'm uh, referring to no, is when he rings the bell. And I'm like I, I and I, I you know I thought, okay maybe he's gonna maybe he's gonna do that thing and he's gonna kind of 
break the Amish code, but to, but for some greater purpose, but, but he finds like another way. How do you think the movie presents the Amish? So I've, uh, I've lived around, um, Lancaster, Pennsylvania before. Oh, really? At one point in time. Yeah. Not, not too close, but close enough that I was, you know, I'd drive through there and I visited some of these like Amish markets and stuff. Like I've gotten, you know, stuck in traffic behind a horse and buggy. And oh, really? If you go to, if you, yeah, if you go to the Walmart, you know, in Lancaster, they have parking spots for for buggies. I don't, I don't actually know that much about like their beliefs or how they how they operate, but but the movie feels like it's very fair to or very. It's a very gentle portrayal of of who they are. Maybe there's people who who would say like, oh no, they should have shown. They should have shown like the controlling patriarchal nature of the Amish, or there's other people who should say like, "Oh, they," but it felt like a very, a, like kind of a loving portrayal of them. Yeah. Um, so, so I kind of appreciated that. Like, um, you know, the the mom and the son want to want to pray when they're eating hot dogs, and right. Um, and and Harrison Ford's character kind of laughs at them, but then, but the the. But it's done in a way that the audience is not invited to join in the laughter. They're kind of showing him to no. be, to not be, yeah, not not cool. A, a, a movie made today would probably want to include some reference or some scene, alluding to, you know, yeah, like I mentioned a second ago, like controlling patriarchy or something. But, yeah, but they they don't do that. I think maybe one of the most telling scenes of an illustration of how people live and get along in our, you know, in this sort of modern world, is the visit to Harrison Ford's sister's house. Which I forgot oh, yeah. about. It was pro- it's a great scene. Where's Jason and Billy? Upstairs asleep. You got a man in the house and the kids are upstairs? That's not your business. So keep your holier than thou mouth shut. Anyway, they like Fred. Fred? Now we got Fred. The vibes are, are not great. Like, she's not happy to be hosting. I mean, she seems like, mm. a, you know, they portray her as a, a nice enough woman, but she's not happy to be hosting these people at the last minute and all that. Yeah, and then, and then you contrast that with the, with the Amish community where it's, everything's very open, um, physically open, and the there's like intergenerational living mm-hmm. and it's uh it's all it's just all very cozy i feel like peter weir's work is all really very much in that vein he, he he seems like he likes to live and exist in a space and a world more than he does to like have a thrust of a plot he has a lot of movies where and you know it's it's tempting to kind of look into stuff and create patterns in a filmmaker's work where they don't exist but um in a lot mm-hmm. of his movies it seems like he really likes to deal with cloistered societies or people yeah. that are separate from the larger society in his early work. I just watched one of his early Australian movies, the last wave. Um, and also mm-hmm. in the plumber, which is a small thriller movie he made for TV, which is kind of a cult movie. He re- was really interested in the Aboriginal culture of Australia, which I thought yeah. maybe that's some kind of, you know, uh, you know, liberal thing of the noble savage or whatever. But I think more it's that he has a, like a abiding love and interest in people who live in separate society separated from a larger one the guys on the boat yeah. in you know they have their own little structure there in master and commander uh obviously like, literally in mosquito coast when harrison ford moves out to like where does he go maui or deserted island or something i was actually trying to figure that out but it's like yeah it looks like sometimes i'm like is this haiti or is this like the northern part of south america i'm not sure where where it is exactly but and I, he has, it seems like he has a, a big respect for people that kind of because he, he was kind of like that himself and that he lived in Australia all the time and then came to America every once in a while to make movies. Um, mm. He never lived in Hollywood. I mean, his his most, I think, commercially successful film, maybe today if you were to show somebody, uh, it would be Master and Commander, but Dead Poets Society was probably his biggest hit, right? His most accessible commercial movie. Was that bigger than Truman? Maybe not. Truman Show might have been his biggest one. But then, that, that, again, there's a movie yeah. about a guy living in a very special time and place, like cloistered away from society as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I was really interested in how, where this movie came in Harrison Ford's like career. Yeah. Because he was just coming off of like, well, of course there was Star Wars, Blade Runner. Um, he was partway through the Indiana Jones, um, franchise and then, and then he's doing this and this seems like, and I don't know, I don't know the perception at the time. Maybe this was him saying like, oh, I need to do a more serious role or something. That's not such action and an adventure. I need to do something, uh, you know, maybe with a little bit of Oscar bait element to it, which he does end up getting nominated for an Oscar. His only nomination, I think, ever. He did this and then Mosquito Coast, for, you know, like the next year. I don't know. I don't know the order they were filmed in or whatever, but. Yeah, this was filmed um, first. 
Yeah, it was interesting that he would do this. These these this and Mosquito Coast at this point in his career when his his power levels seemed very very high. And oh these, yeah. Um. Yeah, he was like one of the got a must have been one of the top top guys at that, at that moment. Oh. And then. Yeah. Um. I don't know. Like, I'm I'm curious if you know because you have I think a stronger sense of like film history and stuff. Like where. <sighs> Well, what would the perception of this been at the time? I think that Harrison Ford, once he was Han Solo and Indiana Jones, he was probably the biggest star. I mean, maybe besides Robert Redford at the time. I mean, he was, uh, you know, huge. And, um, you know, the weird thing about Harrison Ford is I think that if you look back in his catalog, he had so many movies that were very, very contemporary pop, contemporarily popular in the 80s and 90s that haven't really – you know, does anybody talk about what was his movie where he? I mean, he or the the Fugitive or Air Force yeah. One or um, oh he had he he did one of the very many nineties uh, sex murder uh, erotic thrillers. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I, I th- I'm not sure I know which one, but it, yeah, what but was I mean, that? Certainly know the yeah uh, where he was framed for rape. Uh, you know, he he did clear and present day. Oh, uh, frantic. Yeah, he did Clear and yeah. Present Danger, the uh, Jack Ryan movies. But nobody talked yeah. – I mean, all they do now is just dredge him up to play Blade Runner again or Indiana Jones again or Han Solo, right? Yeah. Or he plays sort of like the mentor role in something. But yeah, I, I think this was a good choice. Him doing Blade Runner, I, you know, I'm glad that he was in it and that's a great film that I love. But it seems like an odd choice for him at the time because I can't imagine reading the script for Blade Runner and thinking that Rick Deckard was like an amazing character he just had to play. You know, mm-hmm. um, because I think he's probably the least interesting thing in Blade Runner, maybe. I mean, he there's certain elements to his performance that are interesting, but the film, I think. And I think with this, and especially Mosquito Coast, he really kind of stretches his actor abilities. We eat when we're not hungry, drink when we're not thirsty, we buy what we don't need, and throw away everything that's useful. Why sell a man what he wants? Sell him what he doesn't need. Pretend he's got eight legs and two stomachs and money to burn. It's wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. There are people in New York that live on pet food and would kill you for a quarter. You don't dare take a walk for fear somebody will stick a knife in your ribs. Think about it. You stay home and they come in through the windows. Ten-year-old homicidal maniacs on every street corner. They go to school. <laughs> they go to school. And then I think yeah. kind of as he got towards the end of the 90s, and I think probably how difficult it was to film Mosquito Coast and how that movie was basically a flop and a critical bomb, which I think is really surprising because it's spectacular. I really loved watch. I, I really thought it was great, but um, he kind of just goes back into Harrison Ford to autopilot uh, for a while uh, with Sidney Pollack. He did the movie Sabrina, which is also not very well remembered and wasn't very critically well praised at the time, but that's a, that's sort of a stretch for him to play a romantic lead and kind of a stuffy character uh, whose heart is mm. melted. And, th- and I, I like that movie. I have a little soft spot for it in my heart, but yeah, he kind of went back into a little autopilot Harrison Ford, you know, grouchy grumbling guy for a while and didn't really stretch like he did with this movie in Mosquito Coast, I think, after that. Maybe that's unfair. Someone's more familiar with his with his catalog, but and not to say that he's bad in Air Force One. I think those movies are great. But this is a very different side of him. He's very vulnerable in this movie. I think Kelly McGillis, I mean, obviously, I think she has so much more chemistry here with Harrison Ford than she does, you know, a year later in Top Gun. In Top Gun with Tom Cruise. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that, you know, I, I've never thought of Tom Cruise as a star, as anyone with a, with a particular amount of like sexual energy. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's kind of his, I've, I've joked in the past about him like being, uh, being like, you know, a- asexual or something like that. Like, yeah. Um, not even to make fun of him. That's just kind of the, his the pers- that's his star persona is he's just kind of like a uh, action guy or, you know, serious, competent, funny guy you know i mean he's got charisma yeah. i like tom cruise but you talked about the ending with rachel and harrison ford kelly mcgillis and how you you want them to get together right i mean you really you know that it would be that they're good for each other but only in this sort of s- certain situation like it, harrison ford mm-hmm. couldn't have brought her back to the city right and he has too many things going on uh, and i really like too that i don't mean to get too off track this is another problem i have but when all everything's wrapped up and the police are there uh, Harrison Ford's just smoking a cigarette, leaning up against a car. And this is his <laughs> moment of triumph where he's saved the day, but we don't ever get to hear it or, you know, nobody celebrates him or pats him on the back. We just see him from, I think it's her perspective through the window. Um, yeah. To show that like, that's his different world that he's back in now. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a, he almost seems like a different person. He's smiling, laughing, you know. Um, you know, the, the, the story could have gone in a way that Rachel yeah. decides to run off with him and like, you know, she's going to leave the the Amish world behind or something. 
and they, they, they set it up where, where in that that might that could be a plausible ending um, but then they like they pull back and they're just like you know that's that would actually be very stupid like she's that's not gonna work like uh, um, you know he's not gonna be able to f- like they have this they're very attracted to each other but I think they both sort of understand in the long run this would not actually work and that they they don't they don't ever say that I, you probably I assume you know about how I guess uh, there was like two pages of dialogue they cut out at the end because Harrison Ford said he was sick and they didn't want to record it or something I didn't know um, that. yeah I guess so the, the final scene like on the porch when he's saying good well, he doesn't really say goodbye he doesn't say no. anything um, they had a big conversation written but he he said he was sick um, and I say he said he was sick because I guess that that's happened quite a few times in movies where he just said he was sick. Happened to Indiana and, Jones. Well, and, and there's spe- some speculation that he just says that when he doesn't want to do something. But, <laughs> um, yeah. And that speculation's coming, I guess, from me. But, uh, right. but yeah, they were supposed to have this conversation, but then they don't. They just like look at each other, you know? And I think it's pretty clear. It, you know, to me, it seems like they understand that this was a very intense thing that that could have been, but it, but it probably wouldn't have been long term. It would have just been, you know, some two different worlds. It wouldn't have worked. And I thought that was a really nice handling of that of that story. Um, but you know, I wouldn't say that the, the Harrison Ford is ever humbled, or that the movie ever tries to say something or chastise the sort of modern living lifestyle to say, you know, Harrison Ford learned a lesson after, you know, and now he's going to slow down. For the rest of his life, you know, he's going to take it easy, but it doesn't, you know what I mean? They don't, they don't hit you over the head with anything like that. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. He doesn't, they don't make it like a, and I think a lot of guys, um, that I interact with online would probably appreciate that aspect of the movie where he's never expected or asked to relinquish the, his masculinity. He's always, he's always got that kind of at the front and that's just uh, who he is. And he's not, he had, he, like you say, he didn't have to he didn't have to round off some corner or something before he became like worthy of uh, when there's like the excitement of, of, the, of, of being, you know, you're being hunted by these other corrupt cops and you have this budding romance with the Amish girl. It's quite exciting to be there for a while, but uh, you know, he, he wouldn't have made it like, you know, he, he would have wanted to get back to police work and to being in the big city and that sort of stuff. Like you, that stuff um it's it's quite rare i feel like that people can actually make those changes and 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 it's not to say they, they don't but but i think the movie is 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 very much depicting that like some bridges are are pretty far um it's pretty far to close that gap Guys, thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you'd like to listen to me and Granite's entire hour-long conversation, I'll be posting the uncut audio on my podcast page, George Dahl's Film Journal Podcast, which you can find on iTunes or Spotify. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.